So thank you for watching this video about the NCIHC Code of Ethics. I'm going to be just going through these ethical principles as outlined by the National Council on Interpreting in Healthcare's Code of Ethics for Medical Interpreters. This is the main code of ethics taught in most medical interpretation training programs. However, I will be posting a video later where I do compare and contrast in a very brief sense the three main medical interpreting codes of ethics utilized within the United States. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So first ethical principle, according to the NCIHC, is confidentiality. It states, the interpreter treats as confidential within the treating team all information learned in the performance of the professional duties while observing relevant requirements regarding disclosure. So for this, I really tried to go with just memorable images. I actually had this amazing government teacher in high school who gave us this really simple yet really effective presentation on the Bill of Rights. Big reason why I remember the Bill of Rights is because of that presentation. And a big key to that was using really memorable images. And I thought this picture was perfect. The person handing the key to the other person is the doctor, the patients, whoever shares information about the patient with you, the person on the right with their hands outstretched as a medical interpreter. While we're doing our jobs, we're entrusted with a lot of sensitive information. Not only is it our legal obligation under HIPAA to protect this information, it's also a matter of trust to treat that information as sacred. Even if a patient tells you something outside of the presence of their doctor, it doesn't mean that you go and you tell the doctor. If you learn of a patient's history from one provider at one facility, it doesn't mean that you have the right or the responsibility to divulge that information to another provider at another facility. In some cases, you may be justified in doing this, but generally sensitive medical information should only be shared on a need-to-know basis. You can't assume that everyone knows everything, not even a patient's parent or spouse. Also, there is such a thing as unintentionally breaking confidentiality without even knowing or meaning to. Talking loudly in a public area about a patient, leaving your interpreting notes behind accidentally in a waiting room, these are both ways that I've seen interpreters unintentionally put their patient's privacy at risk. Next up, we have accuracy. This here is a very rarely seen photo of the spirit of the message. Remember, it's always in the room when you're interpreting, whether you convey it or not. So the ethical principle of accuracy, according to the NCIHC states, the interpreter strives to render the message accurately, conveying the content and spirit of the original message taking into consideration its cultural context. So yes, I know this one's kind of silly, but it's memorable, right? Accuracy is all about rendering the message exactly as it is stated, conveying the content and spirit of the original message. So when you hear something in your native language, you know what it means. You know most, if not all, connotations of what's being said. Now, how do you convey that into the target language when you're interpreting? Well, you convey that meaning, that spirit, accurately and completely. This is the cornerstone of interpreting. We don't summarize, we don't add, we don't subtract. We're not mathematicians, we're interpreters. What do all of these rocks have in common? And what do these rocks have in common with ethical principle number three, impartiality? They're perfectly balanced. This is the essence of NCIHC's third ethical tenet, impartiality. The interpreter strives to maintain impartiality and refrains from counseling, advising, or projecting personal biases or beliefs. You're interpreting. It's not about you. Don't let your biases or personal beliefs play into how you're interpreting or interacting with the folks you're there to interpret for. This includes not being all buddy-buddy with the doctor or buddy-buddy with the patient. Don't make the patient even think you're talking about them with someone else outside of their presence or vice versa. Even if you're not talking about someone behind their back, appearances matter. You could be being impartial, but if it doesn't look that way, well, does it matter? 
Being an interpreter is like striking a delicate balance, just like these rocks. You don't want to be too buddy-buddy with the patient or too buddy-buddy with the provider, even if you've worked with that provider or that patient hundreds of times before. And you're also an interpreter. You're not a doctor there to educate the patient on why such and such a medication is better for them, nor a friend there to give them advice on their difficult situation. Doing either of these two things, engaging in these actions, shows you're not being impartial. And it's also kind of, well, it's going to bring me to our next point. Okay, if you're advising, you're being an advisor. If you're counseling, you're being a counselor. If you're giving an opinion, well, you're just sitting over there being in the peanut gallery. If you're not engaging in one of those four roles of the medical interpreter, are you really being an interpreter? What are the four roles of the medical interpreter? Well, you should know these by now, right? Conduit, clarifier, cultural broker, and advocate. If you're not doing one of those things, you're likely not maintaining boundaries. Sometimes you'll hear this ethical principle referred to as role boundaries. This is the fourth ethical principle of the NCIHC Code of Ethics, and it states, the interpreter maintains the boundaries of the professional role, refraining from personal involvement. So what happens if this person goes in between the yellow and white lines? Well, they could get hit by a car, right? Because they're in the space that's for cars, not for pedestrians. And maybe just off the road where we see this grass here, we have a fence that's surrounding a field of angry cows. What happens if you jump the fence and hop into the cow pasture? Well, you might get attacked by a bunch of angry cows, but that's your fault. You went into a space that was meant for cows, not for humans. Okay, let's be real. That might not happen, but it could. So remember, if you're doing anything outside of those four roles of the medical interpreter, you're likely not being an interpreter, point blank. Each of those roles has its own boundaries or limitations. It's your job to stay within them and to know when to switch between those roles. Each of those roles are more involved, and you shouldn't be any more involved than the most involved role, which is, well, the roles of the medical interpreter are generally listed in order, conduit being the default role of the medical interpreter, moving on up to clarifier, a little bit more involved, moving on up to cultural broker, again, a little bit more involved, and then the most involved role of the medical interpreter is advocate. So, don't be any more involved than an advocate. And realistically, as we progress in the involvement of those roles, we should be spending less time in them. We're gonna spend most of our time, like I said, in the conduit role. So I've had patients ask me for my contact information. I've had patients invite me to birthday parties. I've even had providers ask me if I could bring the patient to their next appointment because they were having transportation problems. No! I live in a major city. But this town is a lot smaller than you'd think. I interpret for a lot of the same patients and the same providers. But no matter how many times I interpret for someone, I don't give them my contact information. I'm always super apologetic and kind when they ask, explaining that it's part of the medical interpreter's code of ethics. Ethical principle number five, according to the National Council on Interpreting and Healthcare. You've probably heard the phrase, variety is the spice of life. One of the things I love about living in the United States is just how multicultural we are. It makes things so interesting. And if I want to get a little taste of, oh, let's say Ethiopia, I can go to the neighborhood right next to where my mother-in-law lives and be immersed in a culture different from my own. Part of the NCIHC code of ethics is cultural awareness. It states, the interpreter continually strives to develop awareness of her or his own and other, including biomedical cultures, encountered in the performance of their professional duties. Now, a lot of people get confused by the biomedical part. What? Well, medical culture is a thing. One of my favorite examples of this, and this is kind of like a subculture, it's a medical specialty that has some really unique things going on. Sports medicine which is closely related to physical therapy. When you go to interpret at a sports medicine facility that also provides physical therapy to non-athletes, they have a particular culture that is very much akin to U.S. gym culture, gym rat culture. Lots of bro and 
bruh, reps, and get swole, and specific jokes and slang that you probably wouldn't find in many other medical settings. Okay, it's kind of an extreme example, but each medical specialty and being in hospitals and clinics in general have some common cultural threads. Being sensitive to that culture and educating yourself about it is part of your ethical responsibility. And you'll note that this says cultures encountered in the performance of the professional duties. Well, hey, listen, here in my area, we have a pretty awesome LGBTQ community, including a Spanish-speaking LGBTQ community. LGBTQ culture is a thing, and it's something that, even as a member of the community myself, I've had to educate myself about in the carrying out of my duties as a medical interpreter. Which is why I created my Facebook group, Queer Friendly Interpreters and Translators. So yes, you may need to become more educated about your own culture while honoring this ethical principle. There are cultural beliefs about health and treatments that often come into play when interpreting in medical environments. And the only way we can, one, interpret a message, taking into account its cultural context, and two, be prepared to step into that cultural mediator role, is to have a heavy helping of cultural awareness. Ethical principle number six is called respect. It's pretty simple. The interpreter treats all parties with respect. So if any of you know anything about Japanese culture at all, no, I'm not a Japanese interpreter, I'm a Spanish interpreter. You know that respect is pretty central to many aspects of it. So bowing is one way the Japanese show respect. And as someone who watches a lot of anime, it was the first thing that came to mind when I thought of an image for this slide. But respect doesn't mean overt, respectful gestures. It also means simple things like respecting a patient's autonomy. What is autonomy? It's someone's ability to make decisions for themselves. Part of respecting patients is allowing them to, in some cases, advocate for themselves, to ask their own questions, to clarify themselves. I always say as a medical interpreter, there's a fine line between infantilization and empowerment. Infantilization is, well, treating people like they're babies. Like you have to do everything for them. I, that is not our role as an interpreter. So through our role as an interpreter, we can actually empower patients to make their own decisions. We can help them use their own voice to do things themselves. Now, that's not to say to not step in as an advocate when necessary, but you need to strike a balance. So you've probably seen some movies where it's sort of like a medieval setting and you have knights and kings and queens, and I feel like this is something that always happens in those movies. There's always this situation where, like, a brave knight steps up and says, Don't worry, my lady, I will defend your honor, or something like that. So being an advocate is a little bit like that, but way less dramatic. So the ethical principle of advocacy tells us in what instances it's appropriate for us to step into this advocate role. So advocacy states... When the patient's health, well-being, or dignity is at risk, the interpreter may be justified in acting as an advocate. Advocacy is perhaps the most controversial and least understood role and ethical principle in the field of interpreting. So y'all are really lucky because when I was first starting to interpret, I'll be honest, I mean, there was some kind of vagueness to what being an advocate was all about, when it was acceptable to be an advocate. I feel like there was a different kind of like threshold. Some people would just advocate a lot, unfortunately. And then other people, again, unfortunately, would never advocate, even in some pretty serious situations. Again, it's all about striking a balance. And the NCIHC actually released this amazing document in February of 2021 entitled Interpreter Advocacy in Healthcare Encounters, A Closer Look, to clear up some of the confusion surrounding this role. So the NCIHC Code of Ethics for Interpreters in Healthcare on page 19 says, Advocacy is understood as an action taken on behalf of an individual that goes beyond facilitating communication with the intention of supporting good health outcomes. 
advocacy must be undertaken only after careful and thoughtful analysis of the situation and if other, less intrusive actions have not resolved the problem. So in this guidance document called Interpreter Advocacy in Healthcare Encounters, A Closer Look, they say that an act of advocacy must meet two conditions. It must, one, support the interest of the person, and two, do more than just point out a problem, but also seek to persuade those with the authority to resolve the issue to do so. Advocacy is ideally a collaborative approach, not necessarily a confrontational approach, a collaborative approach. So the NCIHC says that when a patient is facing physical harm, it's usually pretty clear cut and dry when we have to intervene, especially if it's urgent and critical. For instance, if a doctor is about to inject a patient with something we know they're allergic to, we see something, we say something. But if a patient is facing emotional harm or harm to their emotional well-being or dignity, deciding if we should advocate is far more challenging. If a patient in a mental health care setting is crying while answering a provider's question, does that mean that we should advocate for them and encourage the provider to take a step back? We don't have the clinical knowledge to know if this is normal. If it's an expected response that is part of the therapeutic process, we're not qualified to make that decision. And if a provider is being rude, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're justified in acting as an advocate. However, if a provider is being verbally abusive to a patient, that's a little bit different. But we do have to try these less intrusive means to try and resolve the situation. One of my favorite prepackaged phrases is, this is the interpreter speaking. The interpreter would like to remind all parties that she will interpret everything accurately and completely no matter the content of the message. This is not advocacy. This is within the conduit role. I'm just informing all parties of my role as a medical interpreter, and of course, I would be interpreting this into the patient's language, or whoever the non-English speaker may be. This lets them know, hey, I'm interpreting everything, and they might take a second to think about what they're saying. Many times, this resolves the issue of the provider being disrespectful, because it gives them a chance to stop and think about what they're saying. So that, in essence, so that's really what advocacy is all about. I highly recommend reading that guidance document on the NCIHC's website. If you go to their Ethics and Standards of Practice page, that document is available to read there. Ethical principle number eight is professional development. It states the interpreter strives to continually further his or her knowledge and skills. I liked to include Hermione Granger here. Now, before anyone says anything, I'm not a big Harry Potter fan or anything. I am a Ravenclaw, though. But seriously, I firmly believe that part of being an interpreter is dedicating yourself to being a lifelong learner. It's a bit like being a Ravenclaw. And House Ravenclaw values intelligence and learning above all else, along with wit and creativity, to be fair. Part of being a medical interpreter, part of our code of ethics, is to engage in professional development. Our code of ethics mandates that you have a little Hermione Granger inside of you, like it or not. So for those of you who don't know, Hermione Granger always has her nose in books and is always sitting there in class with her hand raised. And yes, I'm absolutely serious when I say I'm not a big Harry Potter fan, I promise. And yes, I do know that Hermione is in House Gryffindor. Cho Chang is a Ravenclaw. And our last ethical principle is professionalism. It states, the interpreter must at all times act in a professional and ethical manner. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to show up in a three-piece suit and tie to interpret for every interpreting assignment. That being said, showing up in jeans and a t-shirt probably isn't a good idea either. Professionalism is more about how you conduct yourself, and being professional is having integrity. I want you to really think about what that word means, integrity. I feel like we say this word a lot without really understanding its meaning fully. Integrity is being honest. It's having strong moral principles. But in the context of our code of ethics, it's following our code of ethics, which is essentially the agreed upon sort of moral compass for interpreters. Being unprofessional would be doing things like accepting bribes, taking advantage of your relationship with providers, misrepresenting your skills, a whole list of really bad things that I hope none of us ever engage in. 
Now, key difference here, a lot of folks get the ethical principles of professionalism and professional development mixed up. Professional development, the key word there being development, is all about improving your skills. Improving your interpretation skills. Improving your customer service skills, even. Improving your soft skills. If you don't know what soft skills are, I highly encourage you to read up on them. Professionalism is more about how you conduct yourself. So that's it. That's my quick and easy review of the NCIHC Code of Ethics. I really hope that you found this helpful. I'm also going to be publishing, like I said, some videos later, more on the medical interpreting codes of ethics, comparing the big, what I like to call the big three, the main three medical interpreting codes of ethics that are recognized in the United States on a national level.